Bismillah, salamu alaikum, peace be with you. Welcome to another episode of Ask Kuda. I am your host, Omar Dunlap, and we have with us, as always, our beloved Sheikh, Dr. Muhammad Salah. Salamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Omar. And I would like to remind our viewers of our telephone number, which is 002 0238 248 or 249. Uh, but I would like to Hold calls for about 20 minutes for today's show. We're gonna, we have a lot of backlog questions, so we're going to be holding any calls that you have for the first 20 minutes, and after that we will take your calls, inshallah. Uh, and I would also like to remind our viewers of our email address at ask at huda.tv. Sheikh, uh, our first question, uh, backlog question, is from Brother Mohammed from Germany. He says, do we have to be truthful and honest in a non-Muslim court? بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفاه سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا وبعد uh, It is indeed very important for a Muslim to be honest whether uh, while dealing with Muslims or non-Muslims not necessarily under oath and it doesn't have to be, be before a judge in a court in general the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said إن الرجل لا يصدق ويتحر الصدق حتى يكتب عند الله صديقة وإن الرجل لا يكذب ويكذب ويتحرى الكذب حتى يكتب عند الله كذابة So uh, everybody has a name or a title that is written with Allah concerning you, me and every person The name is pertaining his or her traits A person would make sure to tell the truth and to say uh, the truth until he will be written were registered before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a truthful person. On the other hand, a person would lie and keep lying and keep lying until he would written before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a liar. In addition to before people, they would not trust him anymore after recognizing that he is a liar. We teach our children that if you lie, you go to hell. This is true. We have to be the first to uh, represent what we learn from uh, our deen. With regards to what some people think, uh, or try to justify their misdoing while dealing with non-Muslims or non-Muslim countries. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّ اللَّهَ أَمُرُكُمْ أَن تُؤَدُّوا الْأَمَانَاتِ إِلَىٰ أَهْلِهَا Whether they're Muslims or not, Allah have ordered us to render the trust to those to whom they belong, whether Muslims or non-Muslims. In a couple of verses in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us, كُونُوا قَوَّامِينَ لِلَّهِ شُهَدَاءَ بِالْقِصْتِ and in the other verse, كُونُوا قَوَّامِينَ بِالْقِصْطِ شُهَدَاءَ لِلَّهِ You must stand out for the truth, or for justice, or to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling the truth. It is very interesting that one verse says, وَلَوْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَوْ الْوَالِدَيْنِ أَوْ الْأَقْرَبِينَ إِيَّكُنْ غَنِيًّا أَوْ فَقِيرًا فَاللَّهُ أَوْلَى بِهِمَا Even if your testimony is going to hurt, a very close relative of yours, such as the parents, al-walidayn, or your own children, or your spouse, you must tell, tell the truth. Not only that, in the Surah Al-Ma'idah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَا يَجْرِ مَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا اِعْدِلُوا هُوَ أَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ Let not the enmity against other people, and hatred against other people, uh, deviate you from being just or from telling the truth. So, in a court or outside the court, a Muslim must tell the truth all the time. Wallahu alam. Jazakallah khair for that answer. We also have from Sister Amina in the United States of America. She wants to know if she swallows water unintentionally, does that invalidate the fast? Uh, this is what the Prophet وسلم, said to answer all similar questions. Uh, the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad will not be held accountable for anything that is done out of mistake or out of forgetfulness or if a person was forced to do anything against his will while it is prohibited. So if somebody drank or even ate a whole meal 
while he was uh, fasting and uh, that was our forgiveness his fasting is still valid he just uh, will continue or resume fasting and doesn't have to make up that day Wallahu alam. Jazakallah khair. she had a second question what is the ruling on an unmarried couple having an abortion uh, this is a very serious issue and we have to understand generally speaking concerning abortion in Islam it is similar to killing it is actually killing and there is a, a ransom and there is a blood money involved in it uh, against the parents or the couple who are involved in addition to the physician or the obstetric who have done uh, abortion. Uh, we have uh, an incident similar to what the sister is talking about. When a woman who is known in the seerah as al maratul al she came to the Prophet uh, and she confessed that she's committed adultery. And her punishment was to be executed by stoning because she was already married. So an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tried to give her the benefit of doubt or uh, four times excuses by saying that perhaps you guys just kissed each other or hugged or or or. Do you know what adultery is? Do you know what's intercourse etc. She said oh messenger of Allah save your time I'm already married out of adultery. I'm already married out of this uh, outside marriage relationship. So at that, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, then go until you deliver your baby. What does it mean? And what is the catch in this incident? If, if the baby was insignificant, or because he is a result of uh, uh, an adultery, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would have punished her immediately, and that's it. No, even if the punishment is much lesser, the punishment is postponed totally until the mother delivers the baby because there is a human being, an innocent human being, who's faultless, who's sinless, who's done any, nothing wrong, and we should not punish him for that. So the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا ترجم المرأة حتى تضع حملها لا ترجم ولا تجلد There is no punishment whatsoever until she delivers. And furthermore, when she delivered, she came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the baby. He said, go back until you wean him. That's two years. Then she went back and she was so sincere and, and eager in repenting. She came back two years later and she made sure that the child was walking and had a, a, a bite or a piece of bread in his or her hand. And uh, in order to tell the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's, he's, he's become independent. He doesn't need me anymore for breastfeeding or anything. And she was sent to uh, be punished. So uh, abortion in Islam is only permissible. In one case, after the third stage, which the Quran and the Sunnah have explained, al-Nutfa, uh, al-Mudra, uh, al-Alaqa, which we call it, Four months and ten days. In أحدكم يجمع خلقه في بطن أمه أربعين يوما. The first forty days, then the second stage forty days, then the third stage forty days, a hundred twenty days, four months and ten days. After that, it is absolutely prohibited, and it is killing to apply abortion or to abort a baby, except in one case, which is if the physician said that if this woman continue. Uh, 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 conceiving or bearing the child, she would die. So in order to save the life of the mother, would uh, abort the baby. But before that, before that, it's not also permissible, except in some very few and limited conditions, such as, for instance, some of the scholars said, if a woman was raped, and in the first few days she, she figured out that she's pregnant out of the rape, it's not her fault. So in this case, it is permissible. And we do not generalize. We do not give fatwa to every couple who are having friendship then it ended up in bed and it's okay because you repented to abort the baby. No. There is no concessions with sins. You've committed a sin. There is no concession for you whatsoever. So the fatwa will be singular and independent and for each case separate. Uh, a girl who's been seduced or raped and she didn't know. So in this case, it is permissible for the wali or the guardian to abort the, the, the baby because it's, uh, she's faultless. She has nothing to do with it. 
but uh, a couple were involved in a friendship and in an illicit relationship and now she is pregnant and they say that uh, it is permissible no it is definitely not permissible wallahu alam Jazakallah khair for that answer. We have a question from Sister Rahma from Nigeria. She asks, if I have, for example, a thousand dollars and I want to give zakah, mm. can I give that zakah, all of it, one thousand to one person, or should I divide it up? Is there some merit? If you have it? one case, one poor person who is desperately in need for the one thousand and you give it all to him, it is valid. If you distribute the one thousand over whatever available of the eight categories listed in verse number 60 of Surah at tawbah that too is available and this is the best case and the ideal condition but sometimes even uh, if the only person we have doesn't need that much but we don't have any other categories so it will be deposited in one or two or three or whatever available of the eight categories of those who are entitled for the zakah Jazakallah khair uh, she had another question uh, what is the Islamic way of reprimanding children? Uh, there are many ways uh, through reward and depriving from their word. Depriving from their word. This excessive punishment through excessive beating, slabbing, and uh, slamming is prohibited. Not only with regards to our children or any other human being, and not only that, including animals. And Nabi Sallallahu forbade uh, beating animals. So uh, there are many ways, such as always linking, achieving any good with a reward. Or depriving the child from a reward or a game that he likes to play or going out or buying new clothes or, 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 or. There are so many ways which we deal with our children with. And sometimes uh, light slamming is, is needed when the, when the child is very, we call it, naughty. Mm. It's very hyper. But uh, what we see in some families, in some cultures, beating the children, this is something that's not uh, really recommended. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Alimu awladakum salata li sab' wa dribuhum alayha li ashr. Teach your children how to pray at the age of seven. But when they reach the age of uh, ten, they must pray regularly and discipline them if they miss. Uh, any of the prayers. So disciplining or uh, darb here does not mean this uh, uh, heart beating like uh, what, we, what we see or we read in, in, uh, in the papers. Jazakallah khair for that. Uh, we have a question from Brother Muhammad from Nigeria. He asks, if I agree with, an, uh, if he has an agreement with an employer to mm -hmm. work a certain amount of time uh, and he leaves early, can he still collect his, his full salary? Is that halal? If his employer agrees to that, there is no problem because it's his employer who is paying him. But if somebody is working for a public uh, office or service, then he takes off, he skips work, or he does other activities while he's working. This is haram because this time is designated to work for this firm or this uh, governmental office. So the time should be dedicated totally. Unfortunately, in many Muslim countries, they estimated the actual working time I don't want to name some countries, less than half hour a day. Because when they go to work, they start eating their breakfast. And by the time they finish breakfast, they start with the tea. They fix the tea on the stove or whatever electricity from uh, the office, which is not permissible as well. All of this time which is wasted, then whenever it's a prayer time, they take off to pray a quarter of an hour before or half hour before, then they stay to pray all the nawafil and do khitam salah and they come later, an hour later, and business is stagnant because people are wasting the time. This is haram. Yes, there should be some time for the prayer, but only limited to the prayer. No side talking, no chatting. There is a lunch break. You want to pray in it? Fine. You want to designate it for serious issues. Uh, but if your employer in a private firm allows you to go and come back whenever you want, that's his business. No problem. Okay. Jazakallah khair. Uh, Brother Muhammad also asks, if a father or a wali is, is examining a suitor for his daughter, uh, can he stop the marriage if he finds some problem in the aqidah? He the, should. Okay. As a matter of fact, he should. That's why Allah entrusted him with the guardianship, with the walaya. Uh, 
wasting those who are under your guardianship is not only by not spending money on them or not by working to support them, but also by entrusting those who are not trustworthy to look after them or giving your daughter to somebody who is not a believer or is not a, a, a righteous person. Okay, Jazakallah khair. Uh, Brother Zubair from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia said that there's a group in India and Pakistan called the Ahlul Hadith. Are they a good group to follow? What I like is not to mention names, but what I like is traits. Are they following the Kitab, in the Sunnah, the Book of Allah, and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, the Sound Sunnah? Then they are on the straight path, even if they have various names. Because Al Jama'ah, which the Prophet ﷺ meant by saying that, uh, will be uh, saved on the Day of Judgment and the only saved party out of the 73 doesn't have a single name, doesn't have a particular uh, name or country or a place or it could be one individual. If the only person in this city who is following strictly the uh, book and the sunnah, the sound sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I don't care about claims, I don't care about labels or names, what I care about is practices and actions. Okay, Jazakallah uh, khair. Brother Hamza, from, also from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, asks, Does the word Qadr refer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power or His will and decree? That he's Qadr. Yeah. Well, it, it comprises all of that in addition to His infinite knowledge. So it begins as follows. Al-Qadr and belief in Al-Qadr, which is uh, the sixth article of faith, as listed in the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam, wa an tu'mina bil qadari khayrihi uh, wa sharrihi, to believe in the preordainment or the divine destiny. It's good and it's bad. Uh, it's bad as it seems to us, but only Allah knows best what's good for us and what's bad. It may be that you hate something while it is good for you, and the opposite is true. So number one, Al-Qadr refers to the, the, the following categories. Number one, the infinite knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That before we were created, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that we will be created and that will be our fate because He is Al-Alim, Al-Khabir, the all-knowing. His knowledge is infinite without space nor time. So He knows the ancient informations, the past, the present and the future. To Him belongs the knowledge of the unseen only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, in Surah Al-Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in verse number 70, أَلَمْ تَعْلَمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَعْلَمُ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ فِي كِتَابِ إِنَّ ذَلِكَ عَلَى اللَّهِ يَسِيرٌ Don't you know that Allah knows whatsoever is in the heavens and the earth? Indeed, all of that is comprised in a book, in Allah al-Mahfuz. That is the second category of Al-Qadr, of belief in Al-Qadr. That whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew in His infinite knowledge, that will take place was recorded by the pen in the preserved tablet and it is preserved beneath the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the sound hadith which is collected by Imam Muslim and narrated by Abdullah, the son of Amr ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah has created the maqadir and ordained the preordainment and the destiny of mankind 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. Third stage, which is, it comprises the following fact, that nothing had happened, or it's happening, or will happen in the future, except through His will. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, for instance, in the story of Prophet Zakari, when his wife was sterile and he reached uh, uh, um, uh, senility, then all of a sudden Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after he, Zakaria, invoked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him a son, the angels came to give him the glad tidings. He was surprised. He said, أَنَّ يَكُونُ لِي غُلَامٌ وَقَدْ بَلَغَنِيَ الْكِبَرُ وَمْرَأَةِ عَاقِرٌ How could this happen? How am I supposed to have a child? And he was already named. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, He will give him Yahya. لَمْ نَجْعَلْ لَهُ مِنْ قَبْلُ سَمِيَةٌ How am I supposed to have a son, a غلام, while I've reached an old age? And my wife is already sterile. Physicians say there is no way that can conceive. What was the answer of the angels? And Jibreel salam told him what? كذلك الله يفعل ما يشاء. This is what Allah wants. If He wants it, it will happen. It will take place. So all the means mean nothing whenever Allah subhanahu wa taala wills. يخلق ما يشاء ويختار. Allah subhanahu wa taala said in another verse 
in uh, Surah Al-Qasas, uh, verse number 68. وَرَبُّكَ يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَاءُ وَيَخْتَارُ That is the last stage, which is, if he wants, he creates. So Allah خَالِقُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Surah Al-Zumar. Allah is the creator of everything. He created us and our actions. So basically, these four categories are the meaning of Al-Qadr. And if we believe in them, that means you are a person who believes in Al-Qadri, Khayrihi wa Sharri. Okay, Jazakallah Khair for that very detailed answer. Brother Sheen from Egypt, he wants to know, can a Muslim marry a Muslim man marry, for example, a Buddhist or a Hindu or an atheist? Uh, a Muslim? Man. Man. Can a Muslim man marry a okay. Buddhist or something? Allah like subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, وَلَا تُنْكِحُ الْمُشْرِكَاتِ حَتَّى يُؤْمِنْ this is a general verse, which means, and don't you marry the non-believing women until they believe. Okay? Then there is tahsis, or an exception. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْمُحْصَنَاتُ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ إِذَا آتَيْتُمُهُنَّ أُجُورَهُنَّ The verse. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made an exception from the general previous verse which it is prohibited totally for a Muslim man to marry a non-Muslim woman except if uh, this non-Muslim woman is a woman who belongs to the faith of the people of the scripture, Judaism or Christianity. And this is a long story which we have discussed repeatedly why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ex exempts them Al Yahud and Nasara, Jews and Christians, and allowed us to eat their Zabiha and marry their women. We spoke before in details uh, about that. I know that we've taken uh, already enough time from uh, the viewers, and now we'll be happy to take the phone calls. Okay, and actually, we have a, a call on the line right now. Sister Um Amar from Egypt, go ahead with your question, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have two questions today. The first one. Uh, as women, do we have to be uh, completely dressed like we're about to pray? If we're, of course, we have wudu and we want to recite Quran in the house, do we no. have to cover? No, our not necessarily. Okay. No, it's not necessary. Oh, but is it okay to just dress anyhow, or is there any? Yes, in a modest clothes. Okay. But if a woman wants to dress similar to the prayer's dress because she's reciting the Quran, this is uh, preferable, but it is not a must. Then the second question, uh, if we're praying the two rakahs after Isha, the sunnah rakahs after Isha, is it okay to combine like two or three intentions like tahajjud and the two rakahs for shakir that goes with witcher also in the same two rakahs? Inshallah? You mean to combine the intentions? Yes. No, because there is a specified sunnah, a specific sunnah, and it is an emphatic sunnah, sunnatun mu'akkada which is the two rakahs after Isha. So this is a, a, a unit or a prayer for fulfilling the sunnah. If you want to pray tahajjud, any prayer that you pray afterward, a mutlaq, an absolute prayer, can count as a tahajjud prayer. Okay, jazakallah. Well, okay, jazakallah khair for your question. Uh, we can go back to this pending question here uh, from Brother Sheen from Egypt. He said, how far away should we be from somebody who's praying in order to not be considered walking in front of them? Okay, uh, very important question. The sutra, for instance, should be right in front of you so that when you prostrate yourself, you will be nearby or just a handful uh, between you and the sutra in order to allow you to perform sujood. So if uh, the masjid, once you enter the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ commanded us, or at home or anywhere, إِذَا صَلَّ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيُصَلِّ إِلَى سُتْرَةِ وَالْيَدْنُ مِنْهَا You must get very close to the sutra. In order to announce to walkers, people who are walking by that, I'm praying, so if you want to cross, you cross from behind the sutra. So the urf or the, the, the common understanding is that if you enter a masjid, you try to find a pole or a pillar or a wall to draw near to it in order to pray. A person who does not do that and deliberately go all the way to the end and people do not notice and of course before him he is the person who is bearing the sin because they don't know and he did not put the sutra. But if somebody is praying for innocence people sometimes do that they come at the door and they start praying the nawafil or the sunan. And there is a whole line waiting. 
So if there is a couple of yards, for instance, between that person and you, you can cross. You're not going to hold the entire masjid because you're praying and you do not have a sutra before you. Okay, Jazakallah khair for that. We have on the line now Brother Abu Hajar from Nigeria. Go ahead, Brother, with your question, please. Assalamu alaikum, Yashak. Wa alaikum salam, Abu Hajar. Uh, my question, my questions are two. Uh, the first question is about uh, an istiba and al ram uh, oh, during the walk in uh, Hajj. Mm. The exposure of your right shoulder and istiba, and then al ram the, the first thought when you are uh, accumulating uh, the first three seconds. What about them? Hello. Yeah. What about them? What is the question? Is, is it? Is it? Uh, what I learned was that it's only done during the walk in the other tawaf, you don't need to do that. Is it authentic? That you only do it for tawaf and kudum? No. That's my first question. Okay. Yeah. Then the second question is, um, when you enter the uh, Masjid al-Haram, Kaaba, before you start the tawaf, do you do tahiyat the Masjid or you shouldn't? Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Jazakallah khair for Thank those you. questions, brother. We have on the line also Sister Habiba from Nigeria. Go ahead, sister, with your question, please. From Nigeria, go ahead, sister, with your question, please. Salaamu alaykum. Wa, wa alaykum salam, sister. If you could please turn the, the volume down on your, your television set. Okay. Okay. Salaamu alaykum. Wa alaykum salam, rahmatullah. Salaamu alaykum. Wa alaykum salam, wa rahmatullah, wa barakatuh. I want to ask if one is observing prayer and you are reciting surah that ended with um, um, sujud, mm. sujud tilawa. Mm. The surah ended with sujud tilawa, like surah to Allah. Correct. So, how do you continue when you rise from the sujud? Okay. Do you re recite another surah or you just go back to. Rukun? Okay. 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 Any other questions? Okay. Jazakallah khair for those We'll go to uh, Abu Hajar's questions quickly, go through okay. them. Uh, there are a couple of uh, sunan or traditions uh, with regards to the very first tawaf, which is known as tawaf al-qudum or the arrival tawaf. Whether you're performing uh, umrah or for instance, if you're coming just to perform uh, uh, hajj. Uh, the first one is al ittiba' al ittiba' means to uncover the right shoulder while keeping the left shoulder covered and this is only for men uh, obviously uh, with the rida' so to wrap the rida' beneath uh, your right arm and shoulder and to cover the left one in the entire seven rounds and once you finish the tawaf you must cover both shoulders in order to be able to pray sunnah al-tawaf the second tradition is to do ar-ramal not ar -raml. Ar -raml means sand. Mm. And ar means to walk briskly. Basically, if you're talking about performing uh, this tawaf during the Hajj season, uh, you'll be so lucky if you can just walk. Not walk briskly, if you can just walk regularly. But you will pretend. There is a story behind these two traditions I discussed in details in the program of Hajj Step by Step. You can find it on YouTube and many other uh, uh, websites but briefly these two traditions the ramal will be uh, practiced in the first three rounds of the very first tawaf not the entire seven uh, rounds and after the third al-tiba' in the seven rounds and al-ramal in only in the first three rounds after the third round uh, you just walk regularly as I said in any case, you'll be walking regularly if you're performing Umrah in Ramadan or if you're performing Umrah in, in, during the Hajj season because of uh, the crowd. Uh, as far as Tahiyatul Masjid or the greeting of the Masjid, there is a Sunnah, Sunnah Mu'akkada, confirmed Sunnah. Every time you enter the Masjid, even if it is during the Friday sermon, you should not sit down before praying the two rak'ahs nafl of the greeting of the Masjid. What about Al Masjid al Haram? Its greeting is at Tawaf. So if you enter a masjid al-haram and there is a tawaf that you're going to do, you're exempt from praying the two rakas. Unless if there is a prayer that you're going to offer, you pray first, of course, the fard, then you start your tawaf. 
At any say time that you enter al-Masjid al-Haram and you're not planning to perform tawaf, then you go, you go back to plan A, which is offer the two rak'ahs before you sit down. Okay, jazakallah khair for that answer, Shaykh. We have on the line now Sister Amina from Nigeria. Go ahead, Sister, with your question, please. Sister Amina, are you there? Okay, we have on the line Brother Muhammad from Nigeria. Go ahead with your question, please. Yes, go ahead. Oh, Sister Amina, go ahead. Yes, um, I have two questions, Sheikh. Um, the first one is um, um, in regards to prayer in the haram. Um, is it allowed for a person to pray in a hotel room that is overlooking the Kaaba mm. and uh, follow the congregational prayer with the rest of the people? For you know those, there's those hotels where you can see the Kaaba from your hotel room. Can you pray um, following the congregation from those rooms? MashaAllah, Sister Amina, you're traveling. You're a rich woman, you're going to perform a hajj, uh, you stay in an hotel seeing the Kaaba. <laughs> yes. Okay? I will answer that, inshallah, uh, once okay. you finish. Okay. And your second question? Uh, a second question has to do with illness. Um, in my country, there's a lot of belief that some illness is as a result of uh, black magic or from jinn. Mm. Um, I know this is a long question, but I was, um, if you could just tell, give me a summary of how one is supposed to uh, know um, how you can differentiate normal illness from that of the gene, and if you can recommend the books that I can go to read to know what the sunnah about those kind of illnesses are. Okay. That's my second question. Yeah. Okay. Jazakallah khair for those questions. Sister Amina, we also have on the line Brother Muhammad from Nigeria. Go ahead with your question, please, Brother. Oh, I think we lost uh, Brother Muhammad there. But if you call back, we'll try to get your, quest your question, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll get back to your questions. So don't go anywhere. You're watching Ask Huda. Philosophy of Islamic Law, a program for restoring belief and trust within Muslims' mind and heart, and for re-establishing a true concept about Islamic rules for others. Amazing stories. In this program, we get to know about people of the past whose stories were mentioned in the Islamic tradition and related by the Prophet, peace be upon him. That verily, us, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we tell you about the best of the stories. We tell you about the best of the stories. When we narrate a story, when we read a story, when we try to benefit from a story, what we are trying to do in reality is to go back through the steps, through the different parts and sections of this story until the story is actually completed and that we can take the actual benefit directly from the story. Sheikh Lutfi will narrate these stories in his program Amazing Stories. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered one of the lands to come closer, the destination. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered one whole city to come closer, to move closer to this dead person. Proactive. Dr. Haitham Al Haddad teaches us how to take a conscious control over our life, set our goals, and work to achieve them in Islam. Take firm steps towards your future, be positive, and be proactive. Every single Muslim needs to have in order to be an effective person. So proactivity uh, in Islam, how to serve our religion and how to serve uh, our life and our guides through all of this. The proactive person is always motivated. The proactive person always have high ambition. The proactive person, he will not 
lose his time. He will not waste his time. The proactive person is a generous person. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to today's episode of Ask Huda. I'd like to remind our viewers of our telephone number, 002-0238-555-248 or 249, or you can email us your questions at ask at huda.tv. Sheikh, uh, we have a question here from Sister Habiba from Nigeria. She wants to know about if, if she's reciting an ayah and it's the last verse of the Quran before going into Ruku'ah, and, but there's a sujood there. Mm -hmm. what, what should she do? She has a choice after reciting the last verse of the chapter that she's reading. Take for example, she mentioned Surah Al-Alaq. The following Surah is Surah Al-Qadr. So she may get up and start reciting Inna Anzalnahu Fi Laylat Al-Qadr or the last verse of Surah Al-A'raf. Then she can just get up and start reciting from Surah Al-Anfal or the other choice is after uh, rising from sujood she can just say Allahu Akbar and go for Ruku'ah again without any need or uh, for reciting another verse or surah. Okay, Jazakallah khair for that. Uh, also, Sister Amina from Nigeria uh, wants to know about uh, prayer in Masjid al-Haram. If she can see the Kaaba from her hotel room, can she, can she pray there? Luxurious Hajj. Mm. Um, if somebody is praying in the Haram and uh, the rows are extended all the way from inside to the outside, second floor and the roof, it's all occupied. Like how beautiful it was on the 27th of Ramadan, they estimated 4 million people. People were like ants, beautiful scenes. I would like uh, for you to look at them on the website. Uh, it's amazing. So in this case, people were praying in the streets almost uh, a half mile or even more, up to one mile distance from the haram. As long as the rows are extended and you can hear and you see the rows in front of you, you can hear the Imam, then the prayer is valid and this is the Jama'ah. But those who take it easy and they pray in their room, 13th floor, 20th floor, pray at their convenience behind the Imam, this is not called Jama'ah. This is not called Jama'ah. So what can you do? You can make an effort and take the elevator and go down stairs to the lobby. If the people are praying in the lobby and you join them, this is a jama'ah. Or praying by yourself in your room, in your convenience, this is not a jama'ah. Okay. Jazakallah khair for that answer. We have on the line now Sister Um Siddiq from Nigeria. Go ahead, Sister, with your question, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, um, please check a one. In your previous show, someone asked question mm. about a woman asked question about um, is it praying some a woman praying while covering her feet? Yeah. Either feet or face. I'm not clear about the question. And the sheikh answered that all the school of thought uh, uh, said that it's haram for a woman to cover her feet. So I'm not clear whether it's feet or face. Please, I want the shape to clear the... Okay, right now, basically the question was pertaining uh, the feet. And uh, the most, uh, uh, the more right view in this regard, based on the hadith of Umm Salama, is to cover the feet, according to the Shafi'i Madhab, to cover the feet while praying. Uh, with regards to the face, a woman must uncover her face while praying. Okay. okay. But her feet, so she cannot wear socks, like socks to pray. I'm sorry, I missed that. Yes. So I cannot wear my socks to pray. You should. This is according to the more right view, you should cover the feet by wearing socks or if you're wearing long skirt or a long abaya that covers the feet, that is permissible. But what should not be covered during the prayer is the face. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. Okay. Uh, we also have on the line Sister Fatima from Nigeria. Go ahead with your question, please, Sister. Uh, hello. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
Okay, my question is first, um, in my school there are these people that have genes and my friends don't believe in it. So I'm asking if you can explain to me about this. Okay, people that have, if you could just repeat that, you have people they in your school. Yeah, um, some people don't believe in it, but I believe. They okay. cannot lie just like that. Okay, in jinn, you're saying, in the jinn. Yeah, okay. because I believe jinn do exist, okay. but some people don't believe, mm -hmm. especially the non-Muslims. Okay. Okay, yeah. okay that's like... Okay, Jazakallah khair for that question. Uh, we have uh, a question from Sister Amina in Nigeria. She said, uh, some people in Nigeria believe that illness can be from black magic. Is that true? And if so, how can you differentiate between a regular illness and one that is from jinn? It may. It is possible. And the hadith of Sahih Bukhari indicated that even uh, uh, things like that may happen. So if anything like that happens can be uh, distinguished simply by number one following the regular procedures. If somebody for instance have headache, you should not speak right away, oh that's a jinn, or this is a magic. He did not check up with a physician, he did not take a medication, he did not figure out whether you really have a migraine or it's something else. When somebody goes to a physician and say you're perfectly fine, you're physically fit, you have a body of 20 years old, you have a, a great memory, etc., etc. But the person is still suffering, uh, cannot open his eyes, have very bad headache, take medication, but it's not affecting or helping. So we try the ruqya. And once we recite, start reciting the Quran, if this person's pain is increasing, is getting severer, this is an indication that there is effect of the uh, jinn or uh, the, the magic or the evil eye, then we focus on reciting the proper ruqya, or reciting the entire surah of Surah Al-Baqarah, the procedures which we cover repeatedly before. Okay, Jazakallah khair for that answer. She also wanted to know if there were any books that you could recommend on this subject that she could read. I'm not sure if you have any. Uh, maybe, inshallah, in another time we'll, uh, we'll verify whatever is available in English. Okay. But I'm not sure what's available in English okay. right now. Jazakallah khair. Uh, and of course there was Sister Fatima's question about some people at her school don't believe in jinn. So how should we explain that to people who don't? Okay, first of all, she said, especially non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, when the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to teach the people of Yemen who were non-Muslims, basically, he did not uh, ask him to teach them about uh, the angels and the divine destiny and uh, teach them about one thing at a time, the most important part, the most important part, which is the foundation. If they don't believe in Allah, if they don't believe in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if they don't believe in the hereafter, how am I supposed to prove to them that there is something called the unseen, and the jinn, and they eat, and they drink, and they have uh, sexual relations, and they multiply? How, how can I uh, in, uh, uh, prove something that I cannot see myself? Right? They believe in material, so you cannot visualize it physically. How, how can you prove that to them? So what we're supposed to do is bring them first to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then once you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the logical and the transmitted evidences, both in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, and in the science that was mentioned in the Qur'an and the Sunnah, countless evidence that proves the existence of Allah and His Lordship and His Oneness, then afterward we teach people what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the unseen. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about other creatures that He created, they can see us and we cannot see them. By saying, إِنَّهُ يَرَاكُمْ هُوَ وَقَبِيلُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا تَرَوْنَهُمْ The shaytan and his uh, his offspring, they can see us, but we cannot see them. And when I quote a hadith that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam caught one of the shayateen, he was trying to mess up his prayer and confuse him while praying. So he got hold of him, and he was about to fasten him against one of the poles of the masjid. But he remembered that Sulaiman alayhi salam, Prophet Sulaiman, made an invocation and said, "Rabbi, have li mulk la yamagi li ahad min baadi." He asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him a domain and, uh, and, and a superiority or a control over the jinn for instance. 
uh, this kingdom and domain, he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him something that would not be given to anyone after him. And that's why no one controls the jinn after Sulaiman uh, alayhi salam. These are stories of the ancient nations. Were you there? No. So how did you know about them? The Quran informed us about all the prophets, 25 of them, their stories informed us about the jinn and how they were subservient to Sulaiman alayhi salam, informed us uh, about the angels, informed us about uh, the world of the uh, unseen. So if you're a Muslim, you must believe in all of that. And if you are not Muslim, then we're supposed to teach the person first the concept of Tawheed and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one thing at a time, one step at a time. أُدْعُهُمْ إِلَى شَهَادَةِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ فَإِنْهُمْ أَجَابُوكَ لِذَلِكَ فَأَخْبِرْهُمْ أَنَّ اللَّهَ عَزَّ جَلَّ قَدْ فَرَضَ عَلَيْهِمْ خَمْسَ صَلَوَاتٍ فِي الْيَوْمِ وَالْلَيْلَةِ One thing at a time. Belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they accept that, they comply, then inform them about the ordainment. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from them to offer five daily prayers, to give zakah, to believe in this, to deny or to denounce that, and so on. Okay, Jazakallah khair for that. We have on the line Brother Abu Hajar from Nigeria. Go ahead, Brother, with your question, please. Assalamu alaikum, Rashid. Wa alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, my question actually uh, asked the question before. The uh, Istibaw and Al Ramal, do you do it only in Tawafu Qudum or do you also do it in Tawafu Ifada? Only Tawafu Qudum, as I said, the arrival Tawaf. Only in Tawafu Qudum. Okay, okay. I think uh, I think we answered his question. I, I, at least I hope so. Uh, we have a pending question here from Brother Sheen from Egypt. Is it better to make du'a in Arabic or English? If you only know English, do it in English. If you only know Urdu or French or Russian, do it in your language. There is no problem. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. If you know it in Arabic or if your language is Arabic, and if you know Arabic and you can make your du'a or phrase it. According to the Quranic verses which include dua, that would be best, of course, particularly in the prayer. Okay, and we have on the line now Brother Nuruddin from Nigeria. Go ahead, Brother. That's a Nigeria day. Yeah, it must be. And I think we, we lost that call, so if you call back or send us an email, Brother, we'll try to get back to you. But we can go to one of our pending questions here from Um Abdurrahman from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Uh, it sa she says that a family member passed away, and the family, what's left is two brothers and one sister. So if the younger brother practices Islam more, uh, is it more appropriate for him to be the wali of the sister or the older brother? Uh, when the father or the guardian dies, the oldest brother will take over the guardianship. And this guardianship or al-walaya would not be confiscated unless if this person is rebellious, such as if he does not pray or if he's an alcoholic, right? But if I have one brother who is more religious, more righteous, that doesn't mean that will be taken from the first because I love this one more or if this one agrees with the proposal which is given to me right now, I would say he is more religious. The order must be followed. Okay, Jazakallah khair for that. Uh, she also asks, if someone prays two rakat, uh, rakat for entering the masjid mm. and then leaves before the iqama, and then returns, do they have to make up or repray that two rakat for the masjid? It depends. How long did he leave? Mm. How long was he gone? How long for? Uh, did he go to make wudu? He doesn't have to pray another tahat al-masjid. He stepped out to answer the phone and instead of picking up the phone and uh, listening to the phone tone, the ringtone in the masjid, this is not uh, something that requires uh, another tahiyyat al-masjid. But if somebody left the masjid completely and returned, then he should pray Tahiyatul Masjid once again. Okay. Jazakallah khair for all of those answers that you've given us today, and thank you What's for being exactly? with us. Yeah. Uh, I would like to remind our viewers that if you have any questions, you can email us at ask at huda.tv. And for those of, the, of you who would like to join in on in our good deeds, inshallah, with a financial contribution, you can email us at support at huda.tv. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. So until next time, I'm your host, Omar Dunlap, wishing you peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance And in your deen allow me to advance Help me in my quest 
Permit me to pass the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test